Batman and Robin are and have always been a father and son team. Everyone Bruce Wayne took in and raised while also training to fight alongside with him are his children. Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Tim Drake, and I'm willing to fight anyone who disagrees with me on this, Cassandra Kane are Bruce Wayne's legal children. Laws changed in the late 90s to early 2000s, so legal wards are no longer an option. So yes, they are Bruce Wayne's legal children that he has adopted. So, Batman and Robin are a father and son team. Cassandra Kane was slash is a Batgirl, so she is not counted into that, and Stephanie Brown for her short tenure is the exception that reinforced that unspoken rule. Meaning that when Grant Morrison decided to reinvent the character of Ibn al Shufashk from Mike W. Barr's 1987 Batman of the Demon in Hanen 2006 started Batman comic book run, Han clearly decided to hammer the final nail on it. Batman Son of the Demon was an out-of-continuity graphic novel which had Batman working together with Raj al Ghul against a terrorist named Quine, who had murdered Raj al Ghul's wife and his daughter Talia's mother, Melisande. During this cooperation, while Batman and Talia's past relationship was reignited, it was also revealed that in the culture in which Raj and Talia live in, marriage ceremonies pretty much go that way, where the word of the father of the bride was the law. Meaning that Batman had been, on the basis of some foreign laws, always been married to Talia al Ghul, and that is why I have been calling Raj al Ghul Batman's father-in-law in my past videos. When they decided to officially consummate their realized marriage, that led to Talia becoming pregnant, and the happiness of fatherhood then caused Batman to become more risk-averse and soften up from being the Grim Dark Knight. Meaning that after a near-death experience both Batman and Talia had, Talia decided to fake a miscarriage to protect her beloved and wow that ending sucked! Makes sense why Grant Morrison would then retcon this out of continuity unity story into Hanen 2006 started Batman comic run with some changes, mostly the fact that Batman and Talia's union led to a birth of a child, whom Grant Morrison introduced to the comic readers in the beginning of Hanen comic book run. And in 2014, Warner Bros. Animation and DC Entertainment decided to adapt those four issues where that child was introduced as Damien Al Ghul as a 74 minute long animated movie, both of which I will be comparing to each other in this video. Father, I thought you were Before I jump into the source material properly, I need to clear some things out first. In the year 2006, when Batman and Son was originally published, the DC Universe was going through the post-Infinite Crisis world state, where the continuity was still the same as it had been since the original Crisis on Infinite Earths, but some things were altered. Batman and Talia's relationship leading up to the conception of Damien was one of those things, and that after surviving through Infinite Crisis, Batman took a year off with Superman and Wonder Woman in discovering himself again, and then came back to Gotham one year later. Around this same time, he also legally adopted Tim Drake into being his legally adopted son, after his father Jack Drake was killed in Identity Crisis, and his stepmother died during Infinite Crisis and Raj al Ghul was killed in a pre-Infinite Crisis story, Death and the Maidens, where Batman cremated his remains to ashes, unable to be resurrected with a Lazarus pit, with more about it coming in later. Okay, that should be all, now to the comic story, starting with... Batman issue 655. The story begins with Commissioner Gordon falling from the roof and being caught in a safety net, where he is identified to have been poisoned with the Joker Venom. On the roof, the Joker has caught children as hostages and as his audience of how he has apparently finally killed Batman, and decides that Santa will be his next victim. While high on his victory, however, the defeated Batman suddenly points a gun at the Joker's face, and shoots him as the real Batman shows up. The real Batman then princess carries the shot to the face Joker to the paramedics on the street level, and lets them pick him up from that dumpster. 
Later, Batman visits Commissioner Gordon, who is recovering from the Joker Venom in a hospital. And they talk about the other Batman with the gun having been an ex cop who snapped. Calming down a little. Commissioner Gordon then changes the subject to Batman having managed to capture every criminal at large with the Joker having been the last one, outside of Two-Face who has gone quiet. So what would Batman do next? After making a sarcastic comment about a new story Gordon was laughing at earlier he means. In transitioning to the next important story scene, Grant Morrison shows how Batman's day begins at 3 pm, how he trains at 5 pm, eats his lunch at 7 pm, and is at work in the Batcave at 9 pm. There as Bruce, he brings up the idea of needing to get out of Gotham more with Alfred, who happily agrees and suggests that they go to an art show after party he has been invited to go in London. When Bruce agrees with the idea, Alfred points out that Bruce responded with the Batman growl, which he had been previously trained himself to do, and now he is doing it all the time. Tim Drake Robin, whom Bruce had adopted recently as his adopted son, then shows up to report that Gotham has gone quiet after the word got out that Batman shot the Joker in the face. Tim puts his civilian clothes over his Robin costume and tells he is headed to the mountains to do something, while also agreeing with Alfred that Bruce should combine the London trip with getting out of Gotham to charge up his energies like how they did during the year off. After Tim has left with the promise of keeping his phone on, Bruce sees his and Alfred's point in needing to take a vacation after mistaking someone on the surveillance feed as Killer Croc. And on the next page we see Francine Langström, the wife of Kirk Manbat Langström held hostage by a woman leading ninjas, who blackmails Kirk over the phone for his Manbat serum, while also telling Francine has been poisoned with a slow-acting poison. After closing the call, the woman's child points out the satellite having captured a private jet going to Britain, which the woman sounds pleased to hear. In London, Bruce and Alfred are checking into a hotel, where they see the agitated Kirk Langström, who excuses them in needing to get medicine to his sick wife Francine, and declines all offers to help. In the elevator, Alfred attempts to brush this off as a coincidence, but Bruce already sees his vacation as ruined, while Kirk rushes to a car with ninjas, who don't care about his pleas on his wife's health. Later, Alfred is helping Bruce get ready for the party, which includes Alfred helping Bruce tie his own bow tie, reminding him to relax and teach him how to act like the billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne is supposed to be. And on the next page, Bruce is shown being the playboy he used to pretend to be in his younger years, to be the last person to be suspected of being Batman, and he manages to convince these women he talks to giving him their phone numbers. While Bruce is happy to have managed to recapture his edge at playing the role of a playboy, Alfred still criticizes him for not having dropped the growl in his voice, and leaves to read Artemis Fowl. And this issue ends with the woman and child from earlier observing the party on a surveillance feed. The woman asks her child to see if he can identify his father among the party guests, and the boy quickly points at Bruce, declaring him to be his father, with the woman now being identified as Talia, saying that they are going to say hello. Batman issue 656. Part 2 of the story opens with Bruce meeting with the host of the gala, Jezebel Jett, who is also a supermodel and the leader of her own African nation. Bruce and Jezebel walk around the art exhibit while making 1% small talk commenting about it, and other party guests like that fictional movie director and the wife of... Who was the British Prime Minister when this came out? Tony Blair, so this is supposed to be Sherry Blair. Anyway, after pointing this out, Bruce and Jezebel go their separate ways because the woman Bruce was with at the end of last issue come back, but Jezebel says that she will call back to Bruce when he is available again. Outside the gala, Alfred is pulled away from reading Artemis Fall and the Eternity Code when he sees Kirk and Francine Langström thrown out of a truck, and in rushing to help them, 
Kirk reveals to Alfred that he was blackmailed into giving Francine's kidnappers his man bat serum. And then a swarm of ninja man bats attacks the art gala, which Bruce recognizes to be an alarming twist, as Alfred throws him his work clothes in a case. For the next couple of pages, we then see Batman fight the ninja man bats while mentally commenting his progress against them, and with the art of the gala providing some visual gags fit for this comic book fight. The ninja man bats come in waves, between which Batman and Alfred evacuate the party guests outside of the building, with only Sherry Blair not making it outside with the others. The waves of ninja man bats then just keep coming and coming, meaning that Batman is eventually worn out and overpowered, with him and Sherry Blair being taken captive by them. When Batman comes back to his senses, he is underground at the mercy of the ninja man bats, who stop his execution when Talia makes her presence and dominance over them known. Batman and Talia's dialogue goes over how Raj is killed and cremated at this point of the DC timeline, before Talia reminds Batman of the time they spent in the Son of the Demon graphic novel, which Grant Morrison decided to rewrite in Batman's response to it that he was drugged and, quote, refused to cooperate in some deprived eugenics experiments, end quote. Meaning that according to Grant Morrison in Hanen version of this story, Batman was raped. Oh my god. So Raj Al Ghul's empire could get the male heir Raj always wanted. Talia then spouts her female privilege in dropping this heir on Batman, while claiming he has been evading his responsibilities, which Batman was never told to have before now by the way, and then Talia departs with her ninja man bats holding Sherry Blair at hostage, leaving Batman to be introduced to his 10 year old son, as the issue ends. Batman issue 657. Part 3 of the story opens with Batman having brought the boy into Batcave, where he and Damien do not start their father-son bonding on the right foot due to Damien's royal and spoiled upbringing. Tim then shows up having returned from his mountain trip earlier than he has planned, and his introduction to his new younger brother does not go any better because of Damien's attitude problem, where he tells Alfred to go vetämään käteen when sent to unpack his things to a guest room. Bruce and Tim talk about this curveball in their lives, with Tim having recently been adopted into being Bruce's son which Bruce promises not to be jeopardized and about Talia having captured the British Prime Minister's wife and said that she would do something else next before dropping Damien in Bruce's hands. Bruce also tells Tim that having been raised by the League of Assassins, Damien is a loose cannon who if left alone to his own devices could be used as a weapon against them so they need to show him the required amount of love and respect that won't make him their enemy. Tim takes offense at this by leaving the cave, right after letting Bruce know that the villain Spook, whom I had never heard of before I read this comic, has taken Gotham's mayor hostage at Blackgate prison and Batman can deal with it by himself. Before going to deal with that D-class villain, Batman goes up to see how well Damien has settled in for his quarters, and based on what we have seen of him so far, how the fuck do you think it's going? At this point, Batman likely comes to believe in the who spares the rod hates their child philosophy, where he however just yells aggressively at Damien while coming across as an angry parent who has had enough of his child's misbehavior. Damien plays his part as Batman then leaves, meaning that the little shit won't stay in his room. In the middle here, that D-class villain Spook is shown having taken over Blackgate prison, and an undercover police officer almost gets caught, but is then saved by Batman and the takeover is stopped quickly, except that the Spook is discovered beheaded. Back at the Batcave, Tim finds Damien playing with a sword and tries to have a do-over in introducing himself to his new younger brother, but the olive branch is snapped into pieces as Damien flexes how he got out of his locked room by reading Alfred's fingerprints, oops, and that he got out of the Batcave by being naturally gifted in imitating other people's voices. A gift which I do not remember Damien using much since this story happened, 
comment below if you remember something I don't. And Damien also reveals that he misread Batman's Your Grounded Order as a challenge to break out of his room to go fight crime like him, but in the way of the League of Assassins. Meaning that Damien was responsible for Spook's beheading, and he took the D-class villain's head with him as a trophy. Damn, Two-Face was lucky to be biding his time and not actively doing any crime at this point. While Tim shockingly tells Damien that Batman doesn't murder people, Damien counters it with the way of the League of Assassins as no mercy, and that by being there, Batman doesn't need Tim as Robin anymore. And Damien also blows up Spook's head with a grenade, which leads to a short fight between him and Tim in the Batcave, which ends when Damien almost gets chewed up by the mechanical dinosaur's jaw, from which Tim saves him from. And Damien replaces his kindness with a sucker punch while explaining why he sees it as the right thing to do, as Tim falls dangerous amounts of meters to a hard stone floor. The issue ends with Batman arriving to the Bat Signal to confront Damien, who has stolen Jason Tudge's old Robin costume in showing he wants to help his father stop his mother's evil plans. In asking where Tim is, Damien just says he quit, with the final page of the issue showing Tim laying on a pile of glass that used to be Jason Todd's memorial. Batman issue 658. Fourth part of this story opens with Talia recording a demand video for Prime Minister Tony Blair while threatening his wife and showing her ninjas taking the man bat serum. And then it switches to Batman rushing to Tim's still barely alive body. While making sure that Tim is still alive, Batman also blames what has happened to Damien, who still under the League of Assassins upbringing tries to justify his actions. Alfred is released from the locked room Damien trapped him into and begins to tend to Tim's wounds, while Batman tells Damien he is too dangerous to be left alone. And somewhere between these two pages, Damien was made to put the Robin costume he stole back into its place, since he is back to wearing his white and black bodysuit. Probably in now seeing how his recent actions have not done what he expected, Damien changes tactics in trying to impress his father by telling him what Batman had almost deduced before he says it. That Talia wants to use the British Prime Minister's wife as a way to acquire Gibraltar for herself. Being told that, Batman takes Damien with him to visit the Langströms and to prevent a very bitter Francine from destroying Kirk's new serums. Later, while lecturing Damien about taking lives not being their default action, Batman launches them into space with a rocket as the fastest way to intercept Talia and her League of Assassins at Gibraltar via a halo jump. At Gibraltar, Talia is sending her demands to Tony Blair to tell all the British soldiers stationed there to surrender, or else she feeds his wife to her ninja man bats, which start taking over the peninsula as Batman and Damien land on Talia's submarine. As they fight Talia's bodyguard, an unseen boat takes Cherry Bear to safety, but Talia doesn't seem to care. Batman says that Kirk Langstrom is consulting with the British army on anti man bat tactics, Cherry Bear is safe, and giving Damien to him didn't lead to Alfred or Tim dying. Because of their history, Batman also tells Talia that she and Damien better get the hell out of there before the British Navy does it for them. Talia, on the other hand, responds by telling Batman to try to reform her out of the villainess she is, and in exchange, she makes him an offer that Batman obviously is going to refuse, because accepting it would cause changes to the status quo. Or it could also assume that Talia is not serious with her offer if she realizes that Batman wouldn't take her offer without negotiating it over, to which they do not have time for. So Batman giving rushed responses ends up giving Talia the impression that the three of them can never be together as a family, and she will now be at war with her beloved. Damien for the first time in the story now is portrayed as his age is, and says that he would rather want his parents to be together, and then the torpedo fired by the British Navy hits Talia's submarine. The story ends with Batman having made it to the shore from the explosion somehow, with Talia and Damien nowhere to be seen. 
Okay, review part first. Art by Andy Kubert was serviceable, but in some places quite odd, and the proportions of the characters' heights and sizes seemed to stretch out here and there. Facial expressions, points of views were also... Well, you comment how these look to you. But when drawing the action sequences, that is where Kubert truly shines. Actually, it would have been something to see this style of animation done. And the story itself. As some of you might have noticed, Damien was not given the best possible first impressions with everyone when he made his debut, and the story was sort of restricted and left rather open-ended. That was because, again, it was the beginning of Grant Morrison's run in writing Batman, and so more of a part one of a larger story with seeds planted to what would be coming next. Damien was not the first thing who would have been coming back, as that Batman who shot the Joker to the face, the Joker who got shot to the face, and the character of Jezebel yet would all be brought back in the larger story Morrison was making here. And that story would then build up when Damien had grown as a character from how he was introduced here, into being more deserving of being made the next Robin after Tim Drake, who went to become Red Robin. Those stories would be the Three Ghosts of Batman, Resurrection of Ra's al Ghul, The Black Glove, Batman R.I.P., Final Crisis, and The Battle for the Cowl. As a quick run-through, because I need to explain them for context, Batman learned that he had been targeted by a criminal organization Black Glove, led by his 1800s-born devil-worshipping ancestor, going by the name of Simon Hurt, who wanted to drive Batman mad, so he could be sacrificed to the Eldritch God they were worshipping. The three ghosts of Batman were one way of doing that. In the middle of that, Bruce Wayne entered a relationship with Jezebel Jet, who was then, by the events of Batman R.I.P., revealed to be a member of the Black Glove to hurt him more, and also during that, Ra's al Ghul came back as a body-snatching ghost trying to possess Damien or Tim as his new body, but eventually settled for a never-before-seen son of his. During Batman R.A.P., Batman was able to defeat slash survive the attack Black Glove was doing to him, with the Joker watching with the knowledge it would happen, and Talia, still somewhat loyal to her beloved, hunted down and killed all the members of the Black Glove. After that, Final Crisis happened, where Batman's death was faked by Darkseid and he went MIA. Then came the Battle for the Cowl, which ended with Dick Grayson becoming Batman in Bruce Wayne's absence, and Damien then became Robin under Grayson's mentorship. Bruce eventually made his way back to help Dick and Damien defeat the resurfaced Simon Hurt and his new Black Glove, and in returning, founded the Batman Incorporated in going public that he had been funding Batman's activities, but was totally not Batman. That was left for forum trolls to debate over. Then the New 52 happened in the middle, and Grant Morrison was forced to rewrite what HAN had planned to do with it, as Batman Incorporated went on a hiatus. Thanks to the New 52 doing some changes to the timeline, Morrison was also able to rework that part where Batman was implied to have been drugged and taken advantage of, aka raped, so Damien could be conceived. Morrison made it so that Bruce and Talia conceived Damien in a consenting encounter during the events of Batman issue 244, and post-coitus, Talia then turned into a yandere that Bruce knew he had to get as far away from as possible. And to end this already long run through, Morrison then ended up having Damien die in the 8th issue of the New 52 Batman Incorporated, fighting an adult clone of himself. According to this 9-year-old interview I took up from USA Today, Morrison had built Damien to be killed off as an analog to Hanelle Itselleen, with Batman and Talia representing Hanen parents. Damian Wayne was pretty much an outlet for Grant Morrison to deal with how Han grew up to realize that Hanen parents were not perfect people. How people change as time goes by and art imitating life. And as Grant Morrison's run on Batman came to a close with the end of Batman Incorporated, 
Damien was meant to live and exist as long. But as Grant Morrison had created Damien as a part of Batman's lore, the character was so owned by DC Comics. And so in 2014, Peter Tomasi, who was writing the New 52's Batman and Robin series starring Bruce and Damien as the father and son team, wrote the story of Robin Rises, where the character was resurrected as no longer an analog for Grant Morrison's self-perceived psychological issues of dealing with Haddon parents' divorce. And that is then the version of Damian Wayne we have today, as written by multiple different writers who more than likely have varying opinions on him, and so end up writing him as either a growing character or as an insufferable brat to make more people dislike him. But back to the Batman and Son story. It did what it was supposed to do in introducing the named character in it, and set up the status quo for Morrison's run in what was going to happen with Batman going forward. It was not all same old same old, that was reserved for the detective comics written by Paul Dini, but it was telling a story pushing the characters into a direction, and seeing how they faced what was coming at them. And considering how the story came out in 2006, with most of what was happening having already happened, the animated adaptation should so have been given the needed guidelines of how to tell its story. But guess what happened instead? <laughs> Son of Batman was released in 2014 as the 19th DC animated original movie and the third DC animated movie universe film after Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox and Justice League War. It was directed by Ethan Spaulding with a story by James Robinson and Screen Bay by Joe R. Ransdale. Meaning that one or both of those two somehow got the dumbass idea to include this Deathstroke impersonator into it. No! I refuse to acknowledge that this is supposed to be Deathstroke, because outside of his appearance, this person is nothing like Deathstroke or Slade Wilson. I will eventually probably do a comic to animated movie comparison on Judas contract, where I will talk more about this, but Deathstroke as a character is best described as a former US Army soldier turned augmented mercenary and assassin who is also a failed bastard of a father and husband. Not an incel former member of the League of Assassins who is bitter that Ra's al Ghul chose Batman as his successor and father of his grandchild instead. Slade in the comics already has two sons, Grant and Joseph, and a daughter, Rose, who was born outside of marriage as the result of Slade cheating on his wife. And according to Christopher Priest's run on Deathstroke, Slade got himself a vasectomy after he learned that Rose exists. Meaning that he would have been unable to conceive children anymore by the time Damien was conceived. And even when this movie is set in its own continuity outside of the comic book's continuity, if you take away the characters who molded Slade into who he is as Deathstroke, then he is not Deathstroke in anything but name and appearance. For more how Deathstroke's imperfect image has been ruined in DC animated movies, stay subscribed for my eventual Judas Contract comparison review, and now let's get back into focusing on this movie. First of all, the movie opens with a ridiculous concept in killing Ra's al Ghul off, as if he is in a hurry to leave it, which includes the Deathstroke impersonator attacking a random League of Assassins outpost with modern weaponry, which overpowers the League's outdated slash old-fashioned low-tech analog defenses. And already I wish I was watching a new scene of Gate where the JSWF fought instead.
Nakutun. Naturally, as modern warfare wipes the floor with the League of Assassins, with the only damage they take is the Deathstroke impersonator losing his eye, because that's basically all Deathstroke is known for, and Raj succumbing to his wounds a mere inch away from a Lazarus spit, with his body still intact enough to be thrown in there and have it rise again, but no. Stop. We have to try. We can't just leave him. He's dead. The pit can't restore a body this damaged. He's beyond healing. Bull fucking shit! If Batman had to cremate Ross in death and the maidens to prevent him from being resurrected again, then this still warm corpse should still be Lazarus Pit eligible. But no. Let the story move the characters instead of the characters moving the story. Talia has been changed into being polar opposite from what she was in the comic originally, aka the main antagonist. You were never needed to be here! Go away! Unlike in the comic to have Damien be a distraction for her actions, in the movie Talia dumps the boy for Batman so she can go pull an ineffective attack on the Deathstroke impersonator and subsequently gets captured to be the damsel in distress for the climax. Was it really too hard to have a female villain in 2014? And was it really necessary to turn her into a damsel in distress instead? The circumstances behind Damien's conception are revealed... Um, well, what does this sound to you? If I remember correctly, I put a little something in your beverage. Same way I remember it. It made you romantic. It made me do what you wanted. Was it all bad, beloved? No, it wasn't all bad. So, was Batman drugged with rubies, aka date rape, or were those performance enhancing drugs? What the fuck does that matter? The dialogue implies that Batman was drugged to the point of not being able to give consent to have sex. But that is brushed aside by having Batman instead think that he liked it afterwards. What the fuck kind of message is that supposed to be? At least Grant Morrison recognized that Hannon's story of Damien's conception in the comic was wrong. And so Han retconned it later to the event being consensual as it originally was in Son of the Demon, with Batman only having come to regret it later. In this movie, they did it the complete opposite. Hey, James and Joe R., how did you end up with this conclusion and come to think it was okay? <sighs> Damien himself is portrayed as more of a likable character than how he was in his debut story art, but more about that later. As for the supporting characters in this movie, Tim Drake's Robin is replaced with Nightwing, which I would be okay for the obvious reasons, but the DC animated movie universe then decided to establish that Dick Grayson is the only Robin, meaning that Jason and Tim do not exist. That is one thing I have come to understand for the same reason why I can understand why Dick Grayson was the dead Robin in BDS. Except that, by omitting Jason and Tim, Batman is now deprived of the character development he got from a death in the family and a lonely place for dying. Also, where Batman forbid Damien from becoming Robin, and only kept him close at hand to keep an eye on the boy. In this movie, Damien is made Robin because, again, it's the story that moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story. And making Damien become Robin was also likely the reason why Jason and Tim do not exist. Not even as Red Hood or Red Robin. The Langstrom family and the Ninja Man bats are also a part of the movie. Except that instead of being blackmailed into handing over the man bat serum, Kirk Langstrom was apparently working for the League of Assassins originally, and to have his wife Francine and their daughter Rebecca involved, the Deathstroke impersonator had them kidnapped as hostages for leverage. 
Kirk is also not implied to have been man bat previously, and that makes me confused at where the idea of ninja man bats even came from. Anyway, the Deathstroke impersonator gets his ninja man bats as enforcers in his quest to not take over the Gibraltar from the British, but instead to find, secure, and sell a Scottish Lazarus pit, and how unbelievably unoriginal, sell it to the highest bidder. That's even more reason to believe this Deathstroke impersonator is not Deathstroke. After Batman and Damien save Francine and Rebecca, Kirk is free to work with them and Nightwing to create an anti-man bat serum, which he is in the movie shown actively administering to the ninja man bats from the bat plane during the movie's climax. And while that is happening outside an oil platform leading to the Scottish Lazarus pit, Batman is down there rescuing Talia in a forced romance kind of way, and Damien is fighting the Deathstroke impersonator until he decides not to kill him. As if he received some off-screen character development that his comic book counterpart didn't receive until much later. Go ahead. Finish me. You were trained to kill your enemies, weren't you? It's what you want. It's what I would do. It's what your grandfather would do. Well, do it! No, I'm my father's son too. I'm Robin. And then Batman, Talia and Damien flee from the underground Lazarus pit cavern, leaving Deathstroke impersonator to fall into his next appearance in the Judas contract. They then have a much calmer final talk with each other without the British Navy about to bomb them, and Damien is given the same, less rushed opportunity to choose if he wants to depart with his mother or father. And considering how in good terms they are here compared to the ending of issue 658, I'm surprised how James and Joe R. didn't attempt to make them be a happy family here in the end. Naturally, since Batman needs a Robin, Damian chooses to go with his father, and Talia relents in departing to fix the League of Assassins after everything has happened, aka prepare to be the villain of the following Batman Bad Blood movie. This was not a good movie in trying to be faithful to the original comic story or as a movie on its own. Remember how I said in my Injustice video essays last year, how Injustice was how most people were introduced to Damian Wayne's character outside of the comics. That was not exactly true as this movie also did that, but unlike Injustice which portrayed Damian as an unlikable character, this movie tried to make him come across as somewhat more likable a little too much. To paraphrase someone else's review I remember from 2016, Damien as Batman's son was turned into a Robin and given too much leeway in doing all the things he did here, from fighting the Deathstroke impersonator, hunting down Ubu in Gotham, fighting Nightwing and being made Robin this fast. I wouldn't call him a Gary Stu like that other reviewer did, because I see it as I have been calling twice already. The story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story. And so this version of Damien came across as a character the viewers were supposed to like, and that kind of logic usually leads to reverse psychology, where the opposite tends to happen. Because Son of Batman followed Justice League War as the third DC animated movie universe film, it had to set up the status quo of Batman in this animated movie universe, and introduce Damien as the not fifth Robin. And they couldn't just introduce the character to become Robin later, he needed to become Robin now, damn it! Following Son of Batman, there were two other animated Batman movie sequels to this film, which were original stories taking inspirations from too many stories to do a comparison reviews on, probably, and should have developed the character like Morrison's run did before Damien had earned his chance to become Robin in the third movie. Casting-wise, I don't know if Jason O'Mara ever grew to have a proper Batman voice, or if people just got used to his performance the more movies he appeared in. Same thing with Stuart Allen as Damien, who as a child actor sounded young enough to play the character, 
but with only Ben Giroux from Batman vs. the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to compare with, eh, I think he was just fine. Thomas Gibson was cast as a Deathstroke impersonator, probably just to have this movie have star power from the criminal mind star. And it's no wonder why he was then replaced with the late Miguel Ferrer in the Judas Contract movie. Meaning that he didn't fade Deathstroke's voice at all and might as well have been an imposter. Morena Bakkarin as Talia could have killed it if she was the villain like in the comic story arc, but she was reduced into being a damsel in distress, so meh. David McCollum as an older British gentleman fit the role of voicing Alfred pretty well, but with Sean Maher as Nightwing, that is where the casting director struck gold. Really ticks me off after all those lectures he gave me about using protection. Indeed. Are you all right, Master Dick? I took the cut. I can take the stick. If only it wasn't the only good thing here in this movie at the price of the other Robin's absence. The next comic to movie comparison review will be on either the Judas contract in continuing how Deathstroke was made to look bad in these animated movies or Superman Red Sun. Until I have chosen which one and have done other videos too, remember to like the video, comment what you think about the comic, the movie and the characters in them down below, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for other videos I have planned to make next. Also, ding the bell for a chance to chat with me when I'm doing gameplay streams for video game recap reviews, and may your heart be your guiding key.